It is anointing Sunday, and, and we're going to walk through uh, the scriptures like we always do, um, and we're going to unpack a ton of things, uh, and, and this is a well-known psalm, so we're going to unpack a lot of things that maybe many of you already know, uh, but my hope is that uh, if you do know that, that it would come to you by way of reminder, and again, so that we might respond accordingly to our Father who is seated on his throne, who is fully in control. And that response might be for the very first time for some of you. And, and man, what a Sunday to celebrate that with you. And, and then the rest of you uh, is to respond yet again. And uh, just a beautiful thing to know that uh, we can continually come back to our Father who loves us more than we could ever imagine. Uh, and so if you have a Bible, uh, meet me in Psalm 23. All right, Psalm 23 is where we are going to be. Like I said, it's a well-known a piece of scripture, just maybe by a show of hands, uh, if Psalm 23 is in your top 10 favorite uh, pieces of scripture, just, just raise your hand, right? Top, top 10. Okay, okay, those who haven't raised their hands because you haven't read Psalm 23, and so uh, no problem, we're going to work through it this morning. Uh, it, it's a well-known psalm, uh, very, very well-known psalm, uh, even in popular culture. So not just in the church, but even in popular culture. You'll find Psalm 23 in various places, uh, even in uh, the, the rock space, right? Rock and roll. Uh, there are bands who have uh, quoted portions of Psalm 23 in some of their songs. Uh, bands like Pink Floyd or U2. Uh, even in the hip-hop world, again, many of you would know this, uh, there are rappers who quote from Psalm 23. Kanye West in his uh, infamous or famous, depends on where you land with Kanye West, uh, song Jesus Walks. Or, uh, let's go old school, uh, how many of you remember Coolio, all right? I mean, he kicks off his song Gangster's Paradise with a portion uh, from Psalm 23. So very, very popular. I mean, the classic, and if you haven't seen it, then man, we really need to pray for you. This anointing Sunday is for you. Um, the classic uh, Titanic, so James Cameron's uh, movie, The Titanic, as the ship is going down, the priest uh, reads Psalm 23. And so a well-known psalm. Uh, the problem is I think many people don't quite understand it. They don't quite understand it, and so again, my hope is as we unpack it uh, this morning that it would become clearer to you so that, you're going to hear me say this a ton of times, so that we might respond accordingly. The gospel demands a response, and so we are to respond to God who gives us the greatest gift that we could ever receive. So we've got a, a ton of things to get through, and so we're going to move quite quickly, and so let's jump straight in. Psalm 23. This is a psalm written by David, King David, uh, who wrote uh, most of the psalms, and so he writes this one, Psalm 23, and he kicks it off by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. Right out the gates, the Lord is my shepherd. He, he starts with the Lord, right? The Lord. The, the word Lord is the name Yahweh in Hebrew. Now, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago, uh, I hope that you would remember uh, us unpacking this name of God, the, the Lord, Yahweh, that, that it was revealed to the people of God through Moses, through the burning bush. Uh, if you are new to uh, the book of Exodus, uh, what happens is, uh, the people of God are kind of in slavery for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and then God says to Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and to tell him that he needs to uh, let, uh, let my people go. And so then Moses goes, well, then if I show up there, like, who am I going to say sent me? And then uh, the, the Lord gives Moses this name, uh, Yahweh. The name Yahweh in Hebrew means I am. If we study deeper, we'll see that it means I am who I am or I will be who I will be. This is a declaration by God that I was God, I will be God, and I always and forever am God. That's what God is saying when he gives us this name, Yahweh. This communicates that everything that exists was brought into existence by and through God. That's what this name means, Yahweh. He brings into existence whatever exists. In the Hebrew, we would say, Yahweh Asha Yahweh. God is not only the creator of all things. You need to know this, that God is not only the creator of all things, but he's also the sustainer of all things, Yahweh, that he holds all things together. The Lord 
Uh, Stephen, uh, last week, just brilliantly unpacked a psalm for us that communicated this, that, that we can look to all of creation, all of creation, and go, you know what? There is a God. He does exist. Yahweh. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. David then says, this Lord, this Yahweh is my shepherd. Now, what is a shepherd? A shepherd is an individual who takes care of sheep. And if you read the Bible long enough, it won't take you too long until you hear from God that he often refers to us, his people, as sheep. And so uh, David is saying, no, no, the the Lord, the, 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 the majestic, the grand, the incredible, he is my shepherd. He takes care of me. Now, I need you to hear this. David is not making a universal statement about God's relationship with all people. When he says, my shepherd, he's not making a universal statement about God's relationship with all people. Yes, he is universally Yahweh to all people, but he is not universally shepherd to all people. And this is important. This is massively important. As we make our way through Psalm 23, this is massively important because, because like I said, many people know this psalm. Many people quote this psalm. Many, many people want this psalm to be applicable to their lives. However, this is not God's disposition to all people. That's not what David is communicating in this psalm. In fact, this psalm is deeply personal. Deeply personal. David is is, is not saying that this this is God's disposition to all of Israel. No, that's not what he's saying. David is is making a statement about God's disposition towards him. This is why he says he is my shepherd. I hope you're listening. The Lord is my shepherd. You see, not, not everyone can say that. Not in David's time in Israel, and dare I say, not even everyone in this room. It's only those, it's only those who believe that Psalm 22, that was fulfilled in Jesus, counted for them. You see, this is important. I mentioned Psalm 22 because, listen, we are, we are never, never, never meant to, to read portions of Scripture in isolation. And yet many of us do. It's what I call smash and grab. And and we love to do that, right? Like I'm going to smash and grab and I'm going to run with this verse and here's what it means. And without going, no, 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 what what did the verse after that say? And then what did the verse before that say? See, we must read the text in context. And, And so if you want to be like David, to be able to cry out that the Lord, that Yahweh is my shepherd, then you've got to believe that Psalm 22 not just happened, but that it counted for you. That's what I know what is Psalm 22 about. I'm glad you asked. See, Psalm 22 are the prophetic words of what is known as the suffering servant, who, who, because we live on this side of the cross, we can say the suffering Savior. It's about the servant of God. This is Jesus who is forsaken, rescued, and then triumphant. If you read Psalm 22, I'm telling you, you'll go, what on earth? That all of this was prophesied about Jesus and then was fulfilled in Jesus, his his death and his resurrection. That's what it's all about. And so if you want to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, then you've got to believe and put your trust in Jesus who came to live the life that you should have lived, who died the death that you deserve who rose from the grave, and that right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father in full victory. If you want to say the Lord is my shepherd, then you've got to believe that that counted for you. He's he's full blood shed for us that satisfied the full wrath of God and granted the full forgiveness. We we need to be fully accepted by God to, to experience the full abundant life. And only those who are his sheep, only those who are his sheep can claim that Jesus is their shepherd. 
You see, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. So, so if you're trying to make the connection, if you're sitting there asking the question, oh, now how did you get to the Lord is my shepherd? So Yahweh, right, speaking of God, and then you, to say that, no, 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 but this also refers to Jesus. How did you make that connection? Well, it's because Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, making that connection that he and the Father are one. See, the, 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 the shepherd of the Old Testament is the shepherd who came and dwelt among us. John chapter 10, Jesus says this, the, the works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. Do you hear that? It's not because this doesn't make sense. It's not because, no, 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 I'm holding on to other things. You know, those things, they matter and we talk about them. We expose them. But here Jesus goes, you know what? At, at the core of it, at the core of it, it's because you are not of my sheep. But, but you, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who, who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Watch this. And then he says, I and the Father are one. So if you're going, well, how did you make that connection? There it is. Jesus says it himself. You see, you are either being shepherded by Jesus or by the prince of darkness. You are either being shepherded by Jesus or by the prince of darkness. Look, we covered this in the series, The Two Kingdoms. There are only two options here. And the world will do everything in its power. It'll use all its resources to convince you that, no, no, there are multiple pathways to life. And yet Jesus goes, no, 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 I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so you are either being shepherded by Jesus or by the prince of darkness. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all, all, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. But God. But God, I'm telling you those are some shouting words, but God who is rich in mercy, he's rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. You are either being shepherded by Jesus or by the prince of this darkness. See, you cannot, you cannot be a citizen of the kingdom of darkness and simultaneously claim that the Lord is my shepherd. You can't. Let's just be honest. We, we need to be honest with ourselves, but then we need to be honest with others because we do this thing where it's like, you know what? You, you can kind of dabble in that and still be a Christian. And yet the Bible tells us over and over and over again, you can't. You either are listening to the voice of the good shepherd or you are listening to the voice of the world. See, only those who are of his sheepfold, can claim that Jesus is their shepherd. And so this begs the question, how, how does this happen then? How does one become part of, of, of Jesus' Jesus's fold and, and have Jesus as their shepherd? Well, it's by surrendering your life to Jesus as both, hear me, as both Lord and Savior. Both Lord and Savior. Friends, Rooted Fellowship, hear me. We should never cheapen grace. We should never cheapen grace. You see, we cheapen grace when we think, you know what, Jesus can be my Savior, but you know what, I'm still Lord over my own life. And some of us in here will go, yeah, honey, I know, I would never say that. Yeah, okay. But your life is telling. That you're going, no, Jesus is my, is my savior, but I'm still in charge of my life. See, when we do that, we cheapen grace. 
And let me tell you, a, a cheapened grace is a no grace at all. Amen. See, this, this cheapening of grace is, is what leads people to the assumption that they can, that they can be the, the children of God when, in fact, they are far from God. This is so important for us, especially in the context in which we live, because I know many of you, many of you, you'll say, I grew up in church. I went to all the ministries. I've done all the programs. I know all the songs. And so you go, therefore, I must be a Christian. No, no, no. To, to be a Christian, you must surrender your life to Jesus, to the good shepherd, as both Lord and Savior. That's the, that's the only way that you can claim Jesus as your shepherd. J John chapter 10. I have here in my notes, it says, maybe talk about, and I'm like, we don't have time. Oh, it was really good. John chapter 10, here's what Jesus says. Verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And then he says in verse 16, but, but I have other sheep that are not, are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So, so Jesus is going, no, no, no. There, there, there are those who, who I know and they know me, but, but there are still others out there who don't. This is why the mission matters. This is why we make much of the mission here at Rooted Fellowship. Well, what is the mission on it? Well, it's the rescue mission that Jesus, Jesus came on, executed brilliantly, and then by grace invites us to be a part of, because he's like, listen, there's still tons of sheep out there that need to be under my care. Yeah. And so the question is, will you go? I'll get to that in a moment. And they listen to my voice. Uh, this word listen in the Greek is akuo, which means, yes, to listen, but, but it's also to hear. It is to pay close attention. And then watch this, it's to respond in obedience. Some of us, were like, no, I'm really good at listening. Oh, and I heard everything you say. In fact, every Sunday, I hear everything. But you're really bad at responding in obedience. And it might be because, it might be because you've gone, no, Jesus is my Savior, but He isn't the Lord of my life. He can say all those things, and they sound great, but I'm not going to put them into practice. Why? Because I know better. That's actually what you're saying. I know better. And they listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. There it is again. There's, there's not multiple shepherds out there. You pick yours, you pick yours. Are oh, you into this music? No problem. You pick yours. One shepherd. See, I, I, like, I marvel at this. It's, because I find it truly extraordinary that, that Jesus, this is, if you've read Colossians 1, you know what I'm talking about, and if you haven't, then you should, right? It's, and Paul writes in Colossians 1, like he unpacks who Jesus is. And so I, I'm, I'm just blown away that, that, that it's that Jesus, yeah. that he would humble himself to become our shepherd. Friends, being a shepherd was not, was not a desirable occupation. It wasn't. It, it wasn't everyone's like career path. It's not what they dreamt about. It's like, you know, one day I'm going to have like a ton of sheep and I'm going to walk around with them and get dirty with them. Like, no, that's not, that's not what people were going for. And yet Jesus humbles himself and he says, I, I, I will be your shepherd. God's love is, for us is so great that he, that he made the decision to be our shepherd. And he is a good shepherd. But let's keep reading. See, when we read the, the next line, the next phrase, in the CSB it says, I have what I need. Most of you would know it as I shall not want. See, these words are often misunderstood as meaning that God fulfills all our desires. But the idea is not that God gives us everything we ask for. That's not what David is communicating here. Rather, he cares for us by giving us everything that we need. You see, sheep are helpless animals. 
I find it interesting that God would compare us to sheep. And then I spend time with you guys and I go, yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> of which I am included, so. Sheep are helpless animals. Left to themselves, they lack everything. I won't say it, but I've heard some people say that sheep are dumb. <laughs> but I won't say it. But left to themselves, they lack everything. And so a good shepherd knows what they need. It's not talking about wants here. It's talking about needs. If the God of the universe is your shepherd, if, if Yahweh is your shepherd, then hear me, you will lack nothing. You will lack nothing. But you might, and I, look, I'm, not, I'm not throwing punches. I'm, like, what I'm about to say is because I, I sometimes find myself there as well. So, so like I'll hear that and I'll be like, hmm, I, I don't know about that. It doesn't feel that way. It's usually because I've confused wants and needs. So I'm crying out to God, and dare I say, fist in the air, and I'm like, why haven't you given me this? I need it. And it's like, no, no, no. Upon further investigation, it's like, no, you would like to have that, but you actually don't need it. That's number one. The, the other reason that sometimes I go, I don't feel like the God of the universe will meet all my needs is because, well, I don't really believe that he is the God of the universe. And so I limit God. I go, I, I don't know if he can, pro I mean, that's, that's a big one, God. It's a big ask. And I don't know if you can come through. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I want you to notice the comprehensive provision of the shepherd in your life. Verse 2 and 3. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along right paths. Do, do you see who does all the work here? He. He lets me lie down. He leads. He renews. He leads me along. F Philip Keller, not related to Tim Keller, wrote the book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's a good book. He worked as a shepherd for eight years, and, and so what he does is he, he records his insights in this book, and he says this about sheep when they lie down. He says, when sheep lie down, it's because they are safe and satisfied. That's why they lie down. He, he, he writes, let me quote, it, it is almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. Owing to their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless they are free of all fear. Because of their social behavior within a flock, sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction with others of their kind. If tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when free of these pests can they relax. Lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. They must be free from hunger, end quote. You see, so lying down implies that sheep are free from fear, friction, flies, and famine. My question to you this morning is, which one is keeping you from lying down? You see, Satan, sin, and the, the false pleasures of this world will, will again do everything in their power with all their resources to convince you that you are not a sheep. They will, they will lie to you and make you believe that you are strong and powerful and wiser than God. But here's the reality. You ready for it? You are not. And you, you see, your fear, your fear, which leads to desperation and a continual grasp for control, is revealing that you are not. Sure. Your ongoing friction and conflict with God and others, and hear me, yourself, is revealing that you are not. The flies and vultures that swirl around you 
revealing that you are not in control, that you are not God, that, you, that you're not strong, that you're not wiser. Your continual starvation and lack of satisfaction, despite the fact that you keep eating and drinking at the table of sin, is revealing. But here we're told that the good shepherd cares for his sheep. He cares for his sheep. He cares for us physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. He cares for them. God knows what we need and he has committed himself to provide for us. Even more, he satisfies our souls and meets our deepest needs. Oh, I, how I hope, how I, I hope that you would have an encounter with this good shepherd. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But then he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's what the good shepherd wants for you. He wants you to experience the abundant life. D David says the, the good shepherd does all of this. And he does it not because you're amazing. He, he, he doesn't do this because, oh, you're so lovable. Right? You are so, this is why I do this, because you are so lovable. No, 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 no. Uh, look, I know your preschool teacher probably said some amazing things about you. I also need to let you know that they were paid to do that. Okay, so, so just, just take that with a grain of salt. Okay? No, David tells us why the good shepherd does this. Why he does all these things. It's just for his name's sake. It's for his name's sake. This simply means that this is for his glory. God is glorified as he keeps his word to us. And the path he leads us on, hear me, is the best one. It's the most direct one uh, to our heavenly home. You see, in this way, he is glorified. God's reputation grows as his sheep follow him. I mean, that makes sense, right? Like every time one is added to the kingdom of God, every time someone surrenders their life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. His reputation grows. Every time like a new church is planted, his reputation grows. Every time someone goes, you know what, I'm going to respond in obedience, his reputation grows. It's for his glory. Hear this. Since water and grass can be hard to find in the land of Israel, shepherds had to be ready to lead their flocks on long journeys from one pasture to another. The sheep would not understand why they left a good place, again to their own thinking, a good place to go and climb up and down steep cliffs through the wilderness. Why? Where are we going? We ask. The ground is high and there's no water here. And still the shepherd leads on. The sheep don't know where they are going, but he does. He has, he has good grasslands in mind, green and luscious, refreshing still waters waiting for us. Not, not a single step of this journey is wasted. Someone needs to hear that today. If you are following the good shepherd, not a single step is wasted. He leads them along the right path. As it is with sheep, so it is with our lives. We can look back and say, why, why, why couldn't we have stayed where we were? Many of us ask that. Why are you leading me here? I don't like this rough terrain. I'm thirsty and there's no water. Are we there yet? We cry out. And still our shepherd leads on. He knows where he is going and when we arrive, he is glorified. When we arrive, he is glorified, but then hear this, we also find great joy. And so because this is true, because all of this is true, that as the shepherd leads and as we follow, we are going to a good place, because that is true, then David then says, even when I go through the darkest valley, again, many of us know it as, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no danger, for you are with me. Guys, do you know, nowhere is trust more crucial than in the face of death. I want the best surgeon working on me. In a life-death kind of situation, I don't, 
And look, man, if that's you, praise Jesus for you and your training and you've got a long road ahead of you. But, but I don't want the second year like I just graduated surgeon on me. No, I want the best. See, like shepherds leading their flocks in search of survival, they occasionally navigate difficult landscapes, maneuvering through deep and harsh swamps, the remains of heavy rains carving through the slopes. The atmosphere in these deep valleys is, is dense and oppressive as, as the day's heat lingers. These valleys are engulfed in darkness with, with towering rocky walls creating long shadows that block out the sun. See, if the flock finds themselves in a valley during a storm, the potential danger of a flash flood cannot be ignored. There's nothing that you can do. Adding to the situation, wild animals hide, waiting for the sheep, waiting to devour. See, the dark depths of these unsafe places serve as a haunting reminder of fears and challenges that come with death. Everyone in here, that, that we have this, this, this feeling towards death. That's why we do everything in our power to avoid it. Even if someone here says to you, hey, I want you to know that when you die, that actually takes you to Christ. Paul said that. When, when they were like, listen, we, that we will threaten you with death. And he goes, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And I'm like, Paul, Paul, Paul that's why you are Paul and I'm on air. But <laughs> yet even then, we're called to still have faith in the good shepherd. See, one of the greatest problems in the valley is fear. Is God still in control, we cry out. Is evil going to destroy me? Will I be swept away? Will I be torn into pieces? All of us know some, some, some kind of form of variation of the, the, the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe for you it's loneliness. You feel so alone and you're like, I've got no one. God, are you still in control? God, can you even still hear me? Maybe for you, it's, it's the uncertainty of tomorrow. Maybe, maybe it's, it's like I'm trying to get a job. I'm sending out my CV over and over and over again. God, where are you? For some of you, it's, it's a sickness. You got the horrible news from your doctor saying to you, it's not good. It's not good. Where are you, God? Maybe it's the death of a loved one. A spouse, a, a child, a, a friend, a colleague. God, where, where are you? They, look, like, I know that the, like, no, no, one, no one can escape death, but sometimes you're like, you know what, God, could you just skip over that person, that one? But it, that doesn't happen, and you're like, well, God, where are you? Richard Fellowship, the the shepherd's presence is the answer to our fear. I know some of us think it's like, no, it's the removal. God, would you remove this? It's like, no, 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 no. What you need to know is that it's the, the presence of the good shepherd is the answer to our fear. Jesus himself trusted God, the Father, through the valley of death. And God was faithful to him. And so if he will be faithful to Jesus, trust me. If you are in Christ, he will be faithful to you. Yeah. Jesus, our shepherd, traveled through the valley of the shadow of death and came out victorious on the other side. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This, this speaks of, 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 of the shepherd's protection, both from external and internal challenges and dangers, from, from predators and from me. Yeah. See, the rod was a, a sturdy wooden stick used as a, a weapon to fight off wild animals. Yep, got a picture of it there. So, you, so if they came close, you'd be able to, depending on your skill. That's why you want the good shepherd and not some random... Anyway. Um, so they had the skill, or they could use it to throw. So I, I want a shepherd who's accurate every time. Yeah. Every time. The staff was a, a long slender stick often hooked at the tip used primarily to direct the flock, yes, but, but, but here the sheep are notorious wanderers. 
And, and, and once away from the shepherd's watchful eye, they get into all sorts of trouble. Sound familiar? <laughs> Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's not just a song that we sing. That's about you. And so we needed the good shepherd to be able to, with his staff, just get that thing around our neck. Let me tell you, it doesn't always feel comfortable. Especially when I'm like, I know where I'm going. Jay, what's, what's, you know what I mean? It's not comfortable. So like, the Lord's discipline doesn't feel great. Yeah, it's because discipline generally doesn't feel great in the moment. But its fruit is good. You prepare a table before me. I love this. The, this tells us that the, that the Lord serves his sheep. He serves you. I mean, who, who prepares a table for a meal? Well, it's, it's servants. Servants. And, and here we're told that it's the Lord who does this. I want you to think about that for a moment. It's the Lord who does this. Jesus came to earth to serve, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came and, and lived the life that you should have lived, died the death that you deserve. Honey, you say this all the time. It's because we're forgetful people. It doesn't take too long before we go, no, I'm saved because I'm good. I'm a good person. God, look at all the things that I've done. That's why I keep saying to you, he came to live the life that you should have lived, so already you're not good. And then the, died the death that you deserve because that's what happens to people who are not good. And then he rose from the grave. Defeating sin, death, and Satan. And is right now, in this very moment, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, clothed in immense victory. See, where most of us, I, I believe, most of us would have probably cashed out our pension fund. We would have rose from the grave and gone, yep, job's done, let me get my pension. I'm, I'm all good, I'm good to go. I've done what we're supposed to do. And then we buy a house by the beach and do dumb stuff like collecting seashells, but that's a conversation for another day. Jesus doesn't do that. We're told that Jesus intercedes for us. R Romans 8 tells us this. It says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Jesus is praying for you by name. I don't get it. I don't know how he does it, but he just does. He's sitting there on his seat and he's going, and so confidence, I just want to pray for you. And then Clarinda, I want to lift you up. Wesley, I want you to know. He's just simultaneously doing it. So if you ever think like, well, I don't know if he knows what's going on. No, he does. He is intimately involved in what is going on in your life. He serves us. He continues to serve us. Jesus, our good shepherd, continues to serve us. You see, he's, he's, his profession never changed. Just his location. The good shepherd prepares a table for you and for me. And where does he do this? We're told in the presence of my enemies. This one was a little bit, mm, you know, I had to read this one a couple times. In the presence of my enemies. Now, now look, it's one thing to prepare a table for me in the presence of my friends. No problem. But in the presence of my enemies, that's bold. And only one who is not afraid of their enemies can do that. And spoiler alert, it's not you. It's not you. you. You and I, you and I, we're, we're, we're checking the seat. You know, we're like, before we sit down, we're like, mm, I don't know if this is, is there anything under the seat. You, you and I, we're checking the food. We're smelling it. You know, all of a sudden, you've got all the allergies. You know, all of a sudden, you, you, you're like, no, but don't you love fish? Oof, allergic, you know, it's like issues. Because you're checking it. You're like, I don't, is this poisoned? You, you're, you're checking the exits. Because if a sneak attack happens, you want to like, I know where to go. That's, that's you and I. But then Jesus says, no, sit, eat, drink. I've, I've already done a security check. And all is clear. In fact, the food and the drink were poisoned. But he drank the cup of wrath so that you and I don't have to. So the only thing the enemy can do now is lie to us. 
That's all that he can do. He's just, he just lies to us. He tells us, no, the food's poison. No, there's a booby. Just be careful. Like, that's what he does. And you know what? What's sad is that most of us, if not all of us, believe him. We look at the finished work of Christ and we still go, I don't, I don't think you can. I don't think you can keep your eyes on Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith and still go, because that means your eyes are of Jesus now. If you're checking the seat, your eyes are of Jesus. No, Jesus says, feast, feast, feast on the goodness of God. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. We'll get, that, uh, get to that in a moment, but it's so, so good. I think, where's, where's you here? Is the, the new King James Version says overfloweth. Is that right? My cup overflows. Overf- I don't know. I don't I know. I know he's into it. I know. And, then, and if it does, that's great because I love that. Overfloweth. It's, it's amazing. But we'll get to that in a moment. Then David ends all of this with the following. In verse 6, it says, Only goodness and faithful love. Some translations say mercy. The Hebrew word here is chesed. This is the unfailing love of God, often used to express God's love that is related to his faithfulness, his faithfulness to his covenant, to his promise. Only goodness and faithful love. And then here this will pursue me. I know some translations say follows. Follows great, but the actual Hebrew is pursue. Pursue. Telling us that God is, is on hot pursuit for your heart. And, and I, I know the language. I know we say it, and I understand what we're saying. The problem is that if we anchor ourselves in what we're saying, we'll miss the beautiful truths of what it actually means. So we'll be like, no, I'm pursuing God, which is true. But that's only possible because he pursues you. And so our, our pursuit of him is only a response to his pursuit of me, of you. Surely, like goodness and faithful love pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Oh, what a psalm. Jesus, as our shepherd, he watches over us and he leads us in this life all into the next For all eternity, for all eternity, when we read the psalm, it tells us that we will be his honored guests. We are honored family. This is like a family reunion that's kind of like we're just waiting for that day where Jesus will return to make all things new. And then it's like, man, it's just a banquet now. But Psalm 23 gets us ready for it. But I want to come back to this anointing. And we're going to respond with this anointing. In a few moments, uh, we're going to have a bunch of people come up front and the band will come up and, and, and they're going to have some anointing oils. And, and if you fall in uh, any of these categories that I'm about to unpack, my hope is that you would respond. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now, look, the Bible says a lot about anointing. It does. There's a ton in there. Lots to read. I don't have time to get into all of them, but here's what I'll do. I'll mention a few categories of where the Bible speaks about anointing and how I believe it's applicable for us. Okay, and then I'll land the plane with what David is actually saying in the text. But, but I believe that when David wrote this, he was thinking about all the other ones, which led him to the one that he wrote. So it's all connected, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a few categories and, and then I'm gonna say, listen, if that's you, then, then, then when I say, okay, let's, let's respond, then, then you would come up and, and be anointed and be prayed for. See, Dave, David writes this. I think one of the reasons, here's the first category. He probably goes, man, have I, have I really been set apart? Have, have I really been set apart? Maybe, maybe he's wrestling with imposter syndrome. I don't know. He's covered in guilt and shame. They are, like, David knows about guilt and shame. I know this is church and, and we pretend here and perform, so that's like, I have no idea what you're talking about today. I think I read it in a book one time. Okay, cool, that's you. But David knows a lot about guilt and shame. And sometimes I believe it would lead him to, I mean, if you read the Psalms, to go, was I really set apart? And, it's, and, and when that happens, I believe the Holy Spirit works in him and reminds him of that time. That time when he had to be called from the fields. You see, uh, if you don't know, let me real quick. Um, the people of God, uh, they worshiping God, it's incredible, it's amazing, but then they take their eyes off him and they start looking at other nations and they're like, ooh, that nation has a king. Oh, wow, and that nation has a king. And they go to God and say, God, we want a king. And God goes, 
I am your king. Okay, great answer. <laughs> and they're like, no, but, you know, totally, but, you know, and we do this all the time, right? Well, I'll follow you, but I would never do it like that. I totally understand what you're saying. A king would end horribly for us, but, but we're different. No, you're not. And so he eventually goes, okay, cool, you, you want to you wanna see how it's going to go? No problem. And so he gives them Saul. And so Saul becomes the first king. And then things go horribly wrong. And then God goes, okay, it's time to appoint another king. I'm done with Saul. And he says to the prophet Samuel, go find this king. And so uh, Samuel rolls up uh, into Bethlehem, finds a guy called Jesse. Jesse has a bunch of kids, uh, has uh, eight boys. Uh, so Jesse goes, let me bring the seven to Samuel, and you can have a look at them. Look at these stunning lads. Uh, I'm sure one of them will become king. Uh, and then pro- <laughs> the prophet uh, Samuel goes, uh, no. Is there, is there no one else? Is there no one else? <laughs> Some of you know what that means. Some of you don't. It's, it's, it's okay. And, uh, and then he goes, well, I've got this young boy uh, out in the fields. What's he doing there? Well, he's tending to sheep. I hope alarm bells are ringing. I hope alarm bells are ringing, okay? I wish we had time. Oh, guys, I, if, we were a, if we were a black church, like I know there's lots of black people here. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. So, we're a black church, but we're not a, like, we're not a black church. Because if we were, may I tell you now, I don't care about the roast that's in your kitchen. Don't you, I t- you wouldn't even come to church with a watch. And I'd be like, you know, and he's out in the, in the field tending to sheep. Let's talk about that 30-minute sermon about why I did But we don't have time. <laughs> but if you're in here and you've never been to a black church, I'm t- grab a friend and be like, hey, bro, can we just one weekend? Just go check. T- it's amazing. But anyway, so alarm bells should be ringing. Anyway, he comes in. Samuel goes, yep, that's him. He gets anointed. He gets set apart. That's what anointing does. It's to be set apart. He was set apart for God's plan and purpose. But there are moments where we forget that. There are moments where David forgot that. I'm pretty sure. I mean, from, from that moment when he was anointed to when he actually sat on the throne, it was like 15 years. It took forever. I'm sure he was going like, what on earth? Like, I remember that I was set apart for this to be king, but why is it not happening? And part of it is that he was on the run from King Saul, who was like, I'm not giving up the throne. So he's now finding himself in caves. You're supposed to be king. And I'm in a cave, like just waiting, like, I don't know. God, did you really call me to this? Did you really set me apart? If not at that moment, then maybe when uh, he he committed adultery. So he slept with another man's wife. That's correct, yeah. Another man's wife. English escapes me at about minute 35. Um, and And then he gets her pregnant, and then he tries to cover it up. So, 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 and the way he does that is he gets that man killed. And then Nathan shows up, praise God for Nathan. He shows up and he's like, my guy, come on, bro. You are an adulterer, you're a murderer, and you're a liar. Repent. We need some Nathans in our lives. And so now it's public news. I mean, we know it's public news because we read about it all the time. I mean, in our time, think about it. If, if, if David had brands, hashtag cancel David. That's what would happen. And so he's probably thinking that, like, man, you know what, like, am I, like, did you really set me apart? Yeah, I'll give you one more. David's life's amazing. One more. Like, sure. so David flees Jerusalem so for about a whole year. He, he leaves because, because there's someone trying to kill him. There's, there's, there's a rebellion against David. And so you can, you can only imagine, I'll tell you who it is at the moment. You can only imagine he's like airbnb somewhere, and people are like, yo, aren't you the king? What are you doing here? He's like, well, you know, there's an enemy trying to get me. And everyone's like, yo, David, trying to get you. This, I mean, it causes you to leave. This, this, whoever this is must be like, you know what I mean, next level. Who is it, David? And he goes, it's my son, Absalom. <laughs> your, your son. Your, your son. Your, it's like, yeah, man, it's like, I, I don't have time to get into it. He's probably, like, have I really been set apart? You said I'm going to be... And God goes, no, no, no. I set you apart for a plan and a purpose. And I already know where some of you are going. It's like, yes. Yes, I can't wait to be prayed for and anointed because I do feel kingly. You know? I do. You know, I've always, I've always told people, I'm kingly. I'm, there's like some royal blood flowing in me. And so you'll be the first person who'll be like, yes, anoint me to be king. And this is, and this is why I tell you, and I say it all the time, you are not David. Okay, you are not David. I know you've heard a sermon and it was epic and you're like, yes, I am David. Where are those stones? Where is the giant? You are not David. 
you, and, and I, trust me, you don't want to be David. But we can still learn from David. Because in those moments, he's going, have I been set apart? Have I, have I, like, it, and it's like, no, let me remember that day when a man came to my house. And I was the least likely. I wasn't even considered. And yet I was brought in. And God said, yes, I've set you apart for a plan and a purpose. You see, all of us have been set apart for a plan and purpose if you are in Christ. And this is a great Sunday to be at church because men of God, a.k.a. me, is here to prophesy <laughs> the plan and purpose that God has for you. Huh? I have a word from the Lord. He has, he, he, if, if you are in Christ, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to know that you have been anointed, that you have been set apart for a plan and a purpose, and I'm here to tell you what it is. Prophesy, man of God. Who is that at the back? Amen. Amen. Here we go. You guys ready? Take out your phones. If you're journaling, start to write the plan and the purpose for you from the very lips of God. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, you have been set apart to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Huh? How amazing is that? I know, like some of you were like, wait, I couldn't scribble it. Don't worry. Don't, Matthew 22, you can go there later. It's great. But there's more. God has anointed you and set you apart for more. There's a plan and a purpose for you. You guys, you guys ready for number two? It's a good one. It's a good one. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if you're thinking, yes, there's more, stop. See, that's the problem with many of you. You stop there. Failing to recognize that Matthew 28 verse 20 starts with the word teaching. But before, if you go look in your Bible, before that word teaching, there is a, a comma. Not a comma means? A comma means I am continuing. I have not stopped. Full stop means end. Starting brand new. No, that's not what Jesus, Jesus goes. No, no, uh, teaching, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. That's your plan and purpose. And again, you might be like, oh, well, that's not what I was looking for. I know those things. Yeah, your life is saying otherwise. I mean, you may be loving God, but you're not loving your neighbor. Some of us here, and I can't even remember the last time we shared the gospel, the good news with anyone. So how are you making disciples? And then we'll, like, we'll do some gymnastics, like some biblical gymnastics. Well, only you see, when I do, when it, it, and then there's this. This is how, this is, the, come on, man. I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing because I do that sometimes. When we, when we share the gospel, it's both information and invitation. Now I get it. Now I get it. Like we partner together in this. Like you'll do the information part and then the invitation is to a Sunday gathering because then they'll hear the gospel. Or maybe you're like, hey, let me do, so, so someone's done the information because they know so much, but they, no one's ever invited you to respond to the gospel. Here's the invitation. You've been set apart. Now, I know some of us might go, you know, it's been a while. I've, I've, I, you've been doing your own thing. You've been, you've been prone to wonder. And so you, you, you find yourself going, have I really been set apart? Like, God, like, if you are in Christ, I want you this morning to, for it to serve as a reminder that God has set you apart for a plan and a purpose. There's no wasted life here. The world out there may cancel. Oh, now I did this and, and I've been canceled. I don't know if I can do No, no, no. Yeah, oh, sure. Let the world do what the world does. We should, not, we should never be surprised when the world does what it does. But let me tell you what God does. God's in the business of forgiveness and grace and mercy. You've been set apart for a plan and a purpose. Would you come up, when I call you, if that's you, would you come up to be reminded of that so that you might leave here knowing that God has a plan for you? Second category. I think David doesn't just go to when he was anointed to be king, but he goes even further back to when he was in the field with the sheep. Now, now look, uh, I've read enough to, to, to know that this is true, that uh, shepherds would often pour oil over the sheep, over the heads of the sheep, for a number of things, okay? And let me give you a few of those because I think they have some real, really good biblical applications. They, they, would, they would pour the, the oil over the head of the sheep to, to, to ensure that there wouldn't be conflict among the sheep. What do you mean by that? You see, sheep usually will butt heads with one another to show dominance. It's so easy to re like replace the word sheep and go, we. We will often butt heads with one another to show dominance, right? Sometimes this causes injuries to the flock. And so to minimize harm, the shepherd will put oil and grease on their heads so that if they clash, their heads will glide off each other without doing so much harm. Maybe 
you don't fit in the first category, but this might be the category that you fit in. You are in so much conflict. So much conflict. You're fighting your spouse, you're fighting your kids, you're fighting your neighbor, you're fighting your, you, Some of you are like, I'll fight anyone. I just, like, I'll just fight anyone. Where the, the gospel brings reconciliation and restoration. And so maybe, maybe you'll come up and you're going, man, I've got, I've got this relationship that I just, I know I'm butting heads. And I know that when I leave here, there's a phone call that I need to make. There's a coffee date that I need to set. Maybe that's you. Come up and be anointed and prayed for so God might give you the strength to do that. The other reason that the shepherd would pour oil over the head was, was for parasites. See, sheep hate bugs, such as flies and lice. This is how I know that I am a sheep, because I, I hate I hate bugs. They like to travel up the sheep's nose and lay eggs in their nostrils. The eggs will hatch into worms that will travel up the sheep's brain. This causes irritation, inflammation, and infection. And they will keep banging their heads to try to get rid of the displeasure. In severe cases, hear this, a sheep may kill itself trying to get away from the pain. The shepherd pours oil on the sheep's head and nose so that the flies, this is the sin in our life, would slide out instead of flying in and causing damage. This is, this is some of the sin and the temptation that many of us are facing. You just feel like everywhere I go, man, like these flowers are everywhere. And I'm like, I, I just, I, you've said no, you've said no, you've said no, but now you're at a point where you're like, you know what, I'm just tired. I'm tired, I'm tired of fighting. And you are like 5'2". Five 5'2 two. Five two simply means that you are almost there, okay? You're almost, so 5'2". So you are 5'2", going, you know what, I'm just going to give in. I'm going to send the DM. Or I'm going to respond to the DM. When you know you shouldn't. I'm just going to give it. I'm just going to stay the night. A per person's not your spouse. Like, I'm just, oh, just so tired. I'm just going to give it. I'm just going to take the pill. I'm just going to have that drink. You just, you're like, I can't anymore. I'm so tired. My hope is that this morning would serve as a reminder that you might be tired, but God is not. He never gets tired. He never gets tired. And he will give you the strength that you need. Sometimes it's just by surrounding, surrounding people, like just around, like to get people around you to be like, you're not in this fight alone. Mark chapter 2. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm borrowing a little bit from the black church, can I? Just a little bit and bring it here. Mark chapter 2, phenomenal. It's, it's where we get told about um, uh, this man, this paralyzed man, and he's got these four friends, and they bring him on a mat, and they're bringing him to Jesus in this house, and they can't get in. And so they go, you know what? We're not turning ourselves, because some of us will do that. I can't get, a little bit of challenge to get to Jesus. Let me just go back. These guys are like, nah. So they rip the roof off the house and they lower the man to get him to Jesus. Some of you are sitting around one of those four. Some of you are the four and you know your paralyzed friend needs to get to Jesus. So some, it, you, they may not, you might go, hey, hey, just, just like a, hey, bud. I don't want to get into it right now. We don't have to, but I just want to come up with you so that you might be prayed for and anointed because God's not done with you yet. I had one more here about being cool, but we don't have time. Third reason, third category that you might fall into why a shepherd would pour oil over the head of the sheep is, is wounds. See, sometimes if the sheep do get injured, whether by fights or anything else in the great outdoors, the shepherd would add oil to the wounds to help it heal faster. And so this it had a healing kind of nature. Why do I tell you this? It's because some of you, like, you, you're not being tempted anymore. You're long gone. You've been living in sin. You think because there's things like financial management and fund management and construction management, you think there's such a thing as sin management. You, you cannot manage. Like we sit here, we're like, I'm, I'm, no, but I'm in control of this. I can manage this without recognizing that you are far gone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You are wounded. You pretend and you perform, but many of us can see that you are wounded. The gospel heals. And so for, for maybe some of you this morning, it's you, you, you're in desperate need of that, that healing that the gospel brings. And so would you come up and, and, and be anointed and prayed for? And it's not just like my, my soul is wounded. Some of you are wounded physically. Maybe you're sick. Maybe the doctor has pronounced something over you and goes, you know, there's, medically there's no hope. Well, I want you to know that 
that God is in the business of doing the impossible. Oh, now, are you saying that I'm definitely going to be healed? No, that's not what I'm saying. But you know what? I'd rather come alongside you and take steps towards the good shepherd. Because even if he doesn't heal you physically, he's going to do something inside of you that is far greater than the physical healing. So if you're wounded, it's an opportunity for you to come up and be prayed for and anointed. See, the good shepherd anointed us. He put his seal of ownership on us and gave us his spirit. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. It says, now it is God who strengthens us together with you in Christ, who has anointed us. He has also put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a down payment. The, the physical things that we're doing here, on their own, possess zero power. There's no, there's, there's no, there's no power in this thing. And, and our sister Clarinda has done an amazing job to put all kind of the elements that we could find in the scriptures to, to try to make it as close as we can to the anointing oil of the Old Testament. But there's nothing, it's just essential oils in here. Anyone can get this anywhere. So you might be sitting here and oh, no, then why? Why must I get up from my seat and come to the front and have someone do this? And Like, why must I do that if they possess no power? See, when you get up from your seat and you come up here because you fall in one of those categories, that is a testimony of what God is doing in your life. I believe for some of you, the healing is not going to happen here. The healing happened when you woke up this morning and went, I just, I feel like I need to go to church this morning. Because in that moment, God healed you. When you walk up here, that's just a testimony of His goodness and His faithfulness. So I need you to know that the power is not in the oil. The, the power is in the name in whom we pray. The Holy Spirit is a sign, a mark that shows the world that God loves us and has set us apart. Number one, for himself, for a purpose and a plan. Number two, that, that God has given us peace. Number three, that God protects us. Number four, that he is healing us. And then the last one, which is according to the text. Let's come back to the text. Why does David mention oil here? Well, it's because he recognizes that God is very hospitable. And that God honors those he loves. See, anointing the head of a dinner guest was a Jewish custom that expressed hospitality and respect. This is why Jesus says to Simon in Luke chapter 7, this is the individual who invited him to dinner, invited Jesus to dinner, but did not show him honor and hospitality. Here's what Jesus says. He says, you didn't anoint my head with olive oil. But she, speaking of the woman who brought the alabaster jar and anointed Jesus with perfume, he says, she has anointed my feet with perfume. Let me close as those who are going to be doing the anointing come up. And I'd ask that you come up and you just kind of line up here in the front and, and people will come and respond. But let me close with this. A man called Kenneth Bailey, here's what he writes about what David is talking about here in this particular anointing. He says this, he says, Just like we would never leave a guest thirsty, staring at an empty glass and wondering if there will ever be a refill, so too this host ensures that the cup of his guests never runs dry. The word anoint here in Psalm 23 is not the word used frequently throughout the Old Testament for the ritual anointing of kings or priests. Rather, the more literal sense of the word is being like a being or a sense of, of growing fat. I know it's something we don't want to hear today, but in this context, you want to be fat. A translation might say, you make my head fat with the oil. Although this might sound strange to us, the, the sense is simply of the freedom of the host, the provision that he gives that is lavish and rich, that it's not inadequate, that it's not minimal. Anointing here is a gesture of hospitality and it, it, it is generous. Like we're just going to apply a little bit here, but I want you to know that the good shepherd, he, like, he's, he's got a bucket and he just, he just lays it on you. Because he's welcoming you in. He's, he's showing hospitality. He's like, you, you are part of me. To speak about my cup is to refer to the psalmist experience of life. David is saying here that the blessing of the Lord says it's flowed freely into every part of my existence such, such that, that, that every, every hand he sees the Lord's like just every time he sees the Lord, every time the, the Lord's hand is over him, he just, he just experiences abundance, regardless of the circumstances. And so that's the last category. That might be you. You might be sitting there going, man, I just, I, 
I, I'm not experiencing this hospitality and this, this generosity from the Lord, this goodness that pursues, this mercy that pursues. I'm not experiencing it. Well, two reasons here. One might be because you've never experienced it, and so this is an opportunity for you to come and surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard of Psalm 23. You've been to church, but you know what? You're going, I have never really surrendered my life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. This is an opportunity to do that. And then watch all the dominoes just kind of fall into place. Watch him set you apart for a plan and a purpose. Watch him heal you. Watch him say, I will protect you. Like, it's amazing. And then he goes, you know what? I welcomed you. Come and feast with me. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. And if that's you, if that's you this morning, you fit into any one of those categories, just you, like once I say amen, in fact, you don't even have to wait until I'm done. Like once I start praying, you can just get up and start making your way to the front and just find one of these individuals and just say, hey man, here's what I, I, I'd love to be praying for. You don't have to get into all of it. In fact, God knows you don't even have to say it. It's up to you. And then watch him work. Watch him work. And so we'll do that for a season. The band will play a little bit and we'll see where this goes. Hey, if, if that's every single person in here, then we'll wait. That, yeah, I know the roast will burn, but I'd rather have the roast burn than you, okay? So... Come, come, come to the good shepherd. He is good and he loves you more than you could ever imagine. And so Father God, I pray for every single person in here. I pray that there would just be a deep sense of your love and your grace and your mercy in this place. Father God, I pray that, that folks would, would stop the pretending and the performing. They would just go, you know what? I am in desperate need of a savior. And we know that that savior's name is Jesus. It's the name that saves. It's the name that reconciles. It's the name that restores. It's the name that heals. It's the name that provides. It's the name that protects. It's the name above every name. And so I pray for the folks, every single person here, you know where they are, Father. You know what's going on. You know the hidden sins in their lives, the, the things that they think that they can manage. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would release them from those sins. I pray against all temptation. That there are folks in here who are sick and tired of fighting. They just feel like they're just so overwhelmed. I pray that the words of Psalm 22 would be true to, for them. That, that you may not remove that temptation, but you know what? You do one further. You prepare a table for them in the presence of their enemies. Enemies that you have defeated. That you have defeated. And so would you renew them? Would you restore their souls yet again? Would you do a mighty work in us this morning, Father? Lord, we love you. We praise you, and it's in this moment we now respond. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.